Imam Musa ibn Ja'far occupies a prominent position within Islamic history. He is revered for his generosity, his patience, his trustworthiness, and his truthfulness. And indeed, he was born on the 7th of Safar in the 128th day after Hijrah, and died on the 25th of Rajab in the 183rd day after Hijrah. Unfortunately, many people do not know enough about the life of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. Indeed, you find many, when they come by the shrine of the Imam, hardly shedding a tear, unlike when they come to the shrines of the Imams of Najaf and Karbala, as I'm sure many of you will agree, that when you come to the Karamain or the Jawadain, or you go to Imam al-Hadi or Imam al-Askar in Samara, you may recite your ziyara, you may pay your condolences, but then there isn't really that same shedding of tears. And in some cases, it produces a certain amount of guilt in the human being. That I've come all this way to Imam al kadhim and Imam Al-Jawad, yet I'm not able to shed any tears in relation to their life. The reason is, many of us have not been able to properly examine the life of this great personality. As in, of all the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, none went through as much torture, cruelty, and oppression meted out against themselves as Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. And that is a statement that needs to be underlined. As for Aba Abdullah, there is no day like Aba Abdullah's day. Yet Aba Abdullah enjoyed a number of years of significant comfort in his life. As for Amir al Mu'mineen, Amir al Mu'mineen, there were a number of years in Medina where he saw the greatness of Islam flourish. As for, for example, Imam Zain al Abideen, one may argue that the first 20 years of Imam Zain al Abideen's life was a life of relative comfort, not more difficult than anyone else. Whereas Imam Musa al kadhim is the Imam of Ahl al-Bayt who was oppressed the most in his life. When you read the traditions which tell you that he spent between 18 to 20 years between prison and prison, from one prison to another, from one guard to another, from one torturer to another, it highlights to you that without a doubt, no Imam of Ahl al-Bayt went through as much oppression as Imam al kadhim Therefore, you find there is a need for us to look at this man's life in order that we're truly able to appreciate not only his standpoints, but also from far away, from Kadhmain, at least pay our condolences by honoring his life story and understanding the message that he left behind for us in our lives today. As we mentioned, the Imam was born on the 7th of Safar in the 128th day after Hijrah. When you hear 7th of Safar, you realize that many of us do not actually celebrate the Wilad of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. The reason being that the followers of Ahl al-Bayt and Muharram and Safar seek to have these nights as nights of mourning, as in these are nights without a doubt when the family of the Prophet were taken on their journeys from Karbala towards Kufa, from Kufa towards Sham. And therefore, in our mosque, it's very rare in the month of Safar for anyone to say, today is the wilad of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. Yet Imam was born on the 7th of Safar, in the 128th year after Hijrah, in an area by the name of Abwa. Abwa is between Mecca and Medina. Imam Sadiq used to have an area there which one may call a plantation. Mufaddal ibn Umar narrates, that we used to go and visit Imam al-Sadiq in his plantation. It was, for example, a summer home for Imam al-Sadiq. Also for Imam al-Sadiq, if he was going from Medina to Mecca on Hajj, he would stay in this place. Thirdly and importantly, Imam al-Sadiq used to, in the land of Abwa, earn his living. Because Imam al-Sadiq used to plow the earth. What he'd make of the plowing of the earth, he'd then sell. And that's why you find one of the companions of Imam al comes to him one day and says, Imam, you are an Imam of Allah on earth. Why do you need to earn a living? Why don't we be the ones who provide you with an earning? To which the Imam replied by saying, one of the acts, which is an act of worshipping Allah, is to earn a lawful living. As an Imam highlighted to us, there is no shame a person who's a scholar, earning a living outside of scholarship, your earning doesn't only have to be in your scholarship. Doesn't only have to be in you, for example, reading books, you reading nikahs, reading istikharas, reading salat al mayyit No, there's no harm whatsoever you going out, buying a plantation, and making profit from that plantation. Because you notice Prophet Dawood, for example, was a tailor. 
Prophet Musa was a shepherd. Prophet Isa was a carpenter. The Holy Prophet worked for Khadija. Likewise, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, not one of them did not have a job. Every single Imam of Ahlul Bayt had a job. Islam wanted to highlight that these are your role models in life. Don't be people who turn around and say that our earning is written by Allah, therefore we'll stay at home. And whatever Allah gives, He gives. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, therefore Imam al Sadiq used to stay in that area of Abwa until Abu Basir narrates that one afternoon we were sitting with Imam al Sadiq when someone came to him and said, Imam, come. He said, what is it? He said, your wife Hamida is about to give birth. When Imam went to see his wife, he returned after a few moments and said to them, Glad tidings to you, my companions. A son has been born to me who resembles Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Therefore, I have decided to name him Musa. You notice that's the only Imam of Ahlul Bayt who's named after one of the Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As in the other Imams of Ahlul Bayt, you may find they may be named, let's say, Ali or Hussein or Ja'far, the only one who's named after a prophet, before the Holy Prophet, was Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. And his mother Hamida had given birth to him. His mother Hamida, of course, who was she? She was a lady of North African origin. Question here is important. Why doesn't Imam al-Sadiq marry someone from his own land of Medina? Secondly, why not marry a Sayyidah from a Medina, considering you're a Sayyid? As in, in our communities today, this is a vital area. The mother of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far was whom? Hamida. Hamida is from North Africa. As in, Imam al sadiq couldn't marry a lady from Medina. Imam al sadiq himself, one may argue, is a Medinian. Why not marry someone from Medina? Surely someone from Medina knows your culture. Surely someone from Medina is more equipped to be living with you. What Imam al sadiq tried to show us was, when you're looking for a partner in your life, your sole concern shouldn't be that she's just from your area. Rather, your concern should be, does this person have the manners, firstly, to be cooperative alongside me? Secondly, are our visions compatible in this world? Then thirdly, yes, culture may play a role. Yet Imam al when he marries someone from North Africa, highlighting that there is no racism within this religion. Because in our communities today, if our sons come to us and say, I want to marry a follower of Ahlul Bayt, but from a different culture. Straight away you find the father and the mother reply back by stating, there is no way you'll marry outside our road, let alone outside our country. Yes, and sometimes you may find some parents who say you can only marry from our village. Others who say you can only marry, for example, from our country. When Imam Sadiq married from North Africa, he set a precedent of five Imams in a row who married from outside. Imam al-Sadiq's wife, North African. Imam al-Kadhim, North African. Imam al-Rada, North African. Imam al-Jawad, North African. Imam al-Hadi, North African. Imam al-Askari, let's say, Roman. All of these Imams of Ahlul Bayt, when they married from outside, firstly, they married to remove the boundaries of racism. Secondly, who told you that it's only your culture which has good attributes? When you intermarry, maybe the good attributes of that culture may come to your culture as well. When there is an intermarriage in our communities, our good values and the good values of that other community, when they come together, they'll produce the best of communities. Number three, when I intermarry from another culture, how do I know I'm not going to bring Islam into that particular culture by that marriage? Maybe the people of that area may come more closer to Islam because I've married from them. They see my behavior with my wife. They see what I've given her in life. And therefore they may come towards us. Therefore the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, firstly, when they married from outside, they wanted to destroy these boundaries of racism. Do you know how sad it is today, for example, in our communities? When our sons want to marry from outside, straight away they're told no. Okay, not from outside. They want to marry someone who's a revert. So that revert has left a whole world to come towards the path of Ahlul Bayt. Say you want to marry that revert? Impossible. I'm, you're not allowed to marry a revert. Why? Isn't that person a follower of Ja'far al-Sadiq as well? Aren't they allowed to marry someone who's a follower of that same school of jurisprudence? Do you know how many reverts there are who come towards the school of Ahlul Bayt who take years before they're allowed to get married? Imam al-Sadiq, his own wife, was not someone who you could say was born from a lineage of Islam. 
someone who came towards the religion of Islam, Imam married her. Did Imam have a problem with marrying a revert, for example? No, he didn't. Secondly, those who say a Sayyid should only marry a Sayyidah, I beg the question, who, where did you get this from? As in if Imam al-Sadiq is marrying a non-Sayyidah, so why should your son, the Sayyid, marry a Sayyidah? There are certain parts in the world where if you say that a Sayyid is to marry a non-Sayyid, I tell you, they'll probably assassinate you. As in they will not have that. A Sayyid has to marry a Sayyidah. You say, but Imam al-Sadiq married a non-Sayyidah. It doesn't matter. You have to marry a Sayyidah. Imam al-Sadiq was trying to say, hold on a minute, just because someone's from the line of Rasulullah does not make them God's gift on earth. There may be someone from the line of Rasulullah like one of his own sons, Abdullah, who had turned up to be an atheist. Or one of the later Imam's sons who turned out to be an ultimate liar claiming he's the 12th of the Imams of Al Muhammad. Aren't they all Sadat? Just because someone's a Sayyid does not mean he's God's gift on earth. Likewise, if someone's a Sayyid, that doesn't mean she's the best of the best and you can only marry her. Therefore, Imam al Kadhim, his mother was originally from North Africa. And do you know what Imam al used to say to her? She is praised. You know, Hamida means praised. She is praised in this world and praiseworthy in the hereafter. That this Hamida, Imam Sadiq, used to do something special with her. Imam Sadiq used to say, if any of the ladies of the Muslim community have any fiqh questions to ask, don't come and ask me. Go to my wife. Her answer is exactly the same as my answer. Now, for Imam Sadiq to say, that a lady's answer is the same as his answer. In a way, what's he showing us? Firstly, he's showing us that the ladies of our communities can reach the highest level of knowledge, even as high as any of the men in the community. That's why in the school of Ahlul Bayt, a lady can become a mujtahid. There's no doubt. There is no harm a lady becoming a mujtahid. She can study all the sciences of the seminaries and she can become a mujtahid eventually who does not need to do taqlid of anyone but herself. So this lady, Hamida, gave birth to Imam al-Kadhim. And without a doubt, when you have a mother and a father who are both knowledgeable and whose visions are both the same, there is no doubt Allah will inspire you to have the greatest of upbringing in terms of your knowledge. Because Imam al-Kadhim, from a young age, his knowledge was mesmerizing in terms of those who surrounded him. Because Abu Hanifa was still alive by the time Imam al-Kadhim was born. In Pakistan and in India, most of the communities there are Hanafis. Most of them follow Abu Hanifa's jurisprudence. Abu Hanifa, as we know, 30% of the Muslim world follows his school of fiqh. In other words, he's a colossus when it comes to fiqh. It's very rare to get a master of fiqh like Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa who used to come to the house of Imam Sadiq. For us, we know Abu Hanifa and Malik were the students of Imam Sadiq. Abu Hanifa used to come to the house of Imam Sadiq, he'd knock at the door, he'd ask, can I speak to your father? Imam Musa ibn Ja'far would look at him, he'd say to him, my father's a bit busy now, what can I help you with? He said, no, do not worry, I wanted to ask your father a theological question, but I don't think you will be able to answer it. Imam was how old at the time? Imam was five. Now imagine, the five-year-old seventh Imam of Al-Muhammad is in discussions with the main Imam of our brothers in Ahl sunnah yes? When he came to him, he said to him, let me answer the question for you. So he looked at him and he said, okay. He said to him, I wonder, is it us who commit a sin? Or is it Allah who makes us sin? Or is it us and Allah? I said, I think it's a question many of us ask. When we commit a sin, is it us who commits the sin? Or is it Allah who makes us sin? Because if it's Allah who makes us sin, it's something useful for us in life, because then we'll say, Allah already knew I was going to sin, so let me do what Allah already knows. So he said to him, he said, I wonder, is it Allah who makes us sin? Or is it us who sin? Or is it us and Allah? Imam al kadhim five years of age, is speaking to Abu Hanifa. He says to him, oh Abu Hanifa, if it is Allah who makes us sin, then it's unfair that we are put in hell when Allah is the one who made us sin. Isn't it? As on the Day of Judgment, I can turn around and say, hold on, why are you putting me in hell when you're the one who made me commit sin? I never had a choice in my sin. You're the one who compelled me to sin. If it is us and Allah, then once again, why are we being put in hell for something Allah was part of? Therefore, he said to him, when we sin, it is all from our own free will. We are the ones who had the choice between right and wrong, and we chose to sin. Hence, the verse says, watch. We have guided him onto the right path. Either he is grateful or ungrateful. Abu Hanifa would leave. 
He'd take that arm 